So recently I've been getting a few questions about these inverters. This is my old inverter. Um, I'm swapping it out basically for the process of making this video and also Mandy wants to use a coffee maker in the van. Now what I've gone for is this beast. Um, and there are two reasons I've gone for it. Number one is it is an absolute definite 2000 watt inverter, so two kilowatt. Um, it's got some safety stuff built into it as well. Um, obviously you can tell just by looking at the two of them <laughs> uh, that this one's built much better. Um, but for me, it was uh, kind of a few simple little things. This one's got two plugs on the front. That's only got one. Yeah, no, you can split it. Um, but this one's also got a remote switch on and off. Uh, yes, this one has a little switch on the front on and off. Um, but the problem with these inverters is they use power if nothing's plugged into them. So if they're powered on with 12 volts, but you've not got anything plugged into the um, alternate current side, the plug socket side, they'll still use power. And they'll use, maybe, you know, depending on the size of the inverter, um, a few amps an hour. So that's a constant drain on your battery, whereas you're not actually using them. So we always suggest switching them off. So that's the coffee maker Mandy wants to bring with us. Well, she has been bringing it with us. Uh, plugs into there whenever we're on a campsite. Um, somebody who's wired their motorhome to an inverter. The inverter then is wired to all the uh, the main sockets around and within those main sockets are two USB ports. When you're doing that through an inverter, you've got your 12 volts to your inverter, 220, 240 volts in the UK, 110 volts elsewhere in the world. You've then got these sockets like you probably have in your house and things like that with both your shore power, your mains power, and USB in them. Now in the back of there, the USB has got something called a transformer, and that's essentially taking that 220 volts, 240 volts, 110 volts, whatever it is, and it's converting it back down to five volts for the USB. Essentially, when power comes to your house, it's as AC, so it's up and down, and it's a lovely smooth, alternating current like that, a pattern of movement of electricity, um, and it's measured in Hertz. You then convert that back down to five volts DC for the USB. And what you've got then is a dirty frequency because it's gone from flat to up, down, up, down, up, down to flat again. And it can cause problems with really sensitive electronics like mobile phones, smartphones, uh, tablets, all that kind of stuff. They don't really like the fact that all that power change has happened. Lots of people said to me, oh, I need um, an inverter because I'm going to charge my laptop. I need an inverter because I want to use um, my fridge and it's an electric fridge. Or I need an inverter because my wife wants to use um, hair straighteners, um, you know, a hair dryer. Or in my case, my wife, Mandy, wants to use a coffee maker. If all you want to do is power um, like a small TV or a laptop or charge your phone, those types of things should be run from 12 volts and there are ready-made adapters that you can get that you can just plug into your 12 volts and it'll charge your laptop or you know power your tv and obviously like i say with the usb converters it'll charge your smartphone or tablet or whatever and that's where i'd say you are then kind of like you know making the most out of your 12 volts because to convert your 12 volts into ac via the inverter that is actually a fair amount of waste to charge a mobile phone. It might be a crazy analogy, but it's the only one I could really come up with. You need um, you need some milk. So you've got two options. You either walk to the shop and get the milk and bring the bottle back, or you push your car to the shop, you put the milk in the car and you push the car back. You've still got you, you've still got the bottle of milk, but one of them was a massive amount of effort and the other one was easy. 12 volts is easy when your hold van is based on 12 volts to then go up and use 240 volts when you really only need 12 volts again or 5 volts for USB is that pushing the car to go and get your bottle of milk or whatever. It's just a stupid amount of effort for something that was otherwise easily done. 
And these laptop chargers will obviously charge other things as well, or they'll provide power to other things. Say, for example, TVs. If you look on the back of a TV, you might say its input is 12 volts or something. And the power pack that comes with it, it goes from the mains plug into this big brick, into a small cable that plugs into the back of the TV. And it was sold to you as just as a generic TV for your house. But if you look at that power brick, it's converting AC to DC, giving DC to the telly. So there's probably an adapter out there that will help you achieve that without having the necessity of uh, plugging it into an inverter. Uh, the next question I'm going to go over is what's the difference between a modified sine wave um, inverter and a pure sine wave inverter? So the pure sine wave is actually the DC current, which is straight, direct current, straight to the alternating current. If it goes nice curve, nice curve, that's a pure sine wave, just like the power that comes into your house from the electric cables overhead. A modified sine wave essentially is a way of stepping up the power and stepping back down in stages. Why do they do that? Well, because it's cheaper and easier to do the step than it is to create the smooth sine wave. To create the smooth sine wave, you need far better electronics than you do to create the step, 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 step. So like I say, pure sine wave, far better quality, and your electronic devices will absolutely love it. Modified sine wave, cheap tech, won't work on it at all. It could even blow up laptops and things like that because it is a nasty way of converting DC to AC. All of this, by the way, is all written down. I've actually made my own blog on my website and I've got diagrams and everything like that. So you can go on my website and read all about it. And it's www.gjot.uk. So if you are unsure about anything I'm saying and the video still doesn't make sense, go read the blog on the website. So the next thing I get asked is, how do I know how much power I need? Um, and this one's quite a simple one. Get the device in your house and get one of those energy saving plugs that you can get that shows you how much energy that device uses when you plug it in. So you plug it in the outlet, you plug your device into this little meter and then switch it on and it'll show you its maximum power surge and its running level and things like that. And that's what we did with the coffee maker. And the coffee maker said, uh, that it was around about sort of um, 400 to 800 watts ongoing and it peaked just over a thousand watts uh, when it was actually you know switched on and then it starts to boil the, the kettle if you like and start to butts to boil the water so i knew then that i need a thousand watts now the second sort of problem that you're going to look at here is you don't want to maximize the output of your inverter straight away because it's charged chances you're going to blow it up or it'll just pack up it's just too close to its operating limits it just it'll just pack up so my way of looking at it is get double if you need a thousand watts get two thousand and that's what i've done um, if you only need 75 watts get a 150 watt now that i know i need a thousand watts of power and i've got a 12 volt power supply in my van via the leisure batteries I can work out the amps that that's going to draw from my batteries to make sure that my batteries are powerful enough. And the way they do that is we divide the watts via the volts. So that's a thousand watts for the coffee maker divided by 12 volts, the leisure batteries. And we get 83 point blah, 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 blah amps. So call it 85 amps. Um, that's per hour. Obviously, the coffee machine um, literally just goes bing boils the kettle for a minute, you know, boils the water inside for a minute, produces the coffee, switches off, literally within three minutes you're done. So I'm only going to need 85 amps for maybe two minutes, um, and then I'll need you know less amps for that, maybe sort of like 40 amps or something like that. So I'm not too worried about my battery long term, because it's not going to be running maxed out like that. However, I need to make sure that the battery's got enough power for that. Because the second problem with leisure batteries, if it says 100 amps on there, you're only ever going to get 50 amps out of it. It's just the way batteries work. They can never supply their total power in one go. So that's it. It's half. So I've got uh, two 130 amp per hour batteries. That gives me 260. But then again, I'm halving it. So I've got 130. So essentially I've got a nice big 130 power pack. I'm going to draw 85 out of it for a brief amount of time. I'm going to be fine. I've got a solar panel on the roof and I drive every day. 
So I am always going to replenish the power in the battery. Even if Mandy has six brews a day, I'm going to be fine. So what we need to do now is we need to talk about how you wire batteries up. Because I am going to talk about the plural of batteries. I'm going to assume, like me, that if you put in a big inverter in, you've got at least two batteries. And they should always really be in pairs as well, just to make it even. But it doesn't necessarily have to be, but it should be in pairs just so that um, you know, you've not got an odd size battery for the first battery and a bigger battery on the second one or something like that because I'm going to talk about the way they're wired and a lot of people don't know this and it's strange but a lot of people go oh so do I do red and black and red and black and you're like no you don't want 24 volts you go red to red and black to black and then you create 12 volts still but you've got this bigger capacity of the battery bank so it's red to red black to black and that's what most people do. And then they go, boss, right, I'm all wired on. And what they miss is quite a crucial little bit here. And um, again, I'll refer you back to the website um, to read more about it, but I'm gonna put the diagrams on the screen now so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, and a lot of people basically have the two batteries. So battery A and battery B, they wire them red to red, black to black. And then from battery A, because that's closest to the power, so the power source they need or whatever, they'll go ground from battery A, and then they'll go um, power out from battery A and that's it and they think that's great what you're doing at that point is you're putting all the stress on battery A and it's going to deplete much faster than the two batteries wired together correctly because battery A is going to be like oh, I'm losing all my power battery B is going to go oh it's all right mate I'll give you a bit I'll give you a bit and they're not working together battery A is doing the hard work and battery B is kind of like his backup what you really need to do is have the ground out of battery A, but have the positive out of battery B. And what you've then got is your two batteries, both providing the power simultaneously as a battery bank, because it's got to feed through one battery to get out of the other one. So essentially, you are joining those batteries truly together to produce the bigger current. It's still 12 volts, but you're producing the bigger current and it'll flow correctly through both batteries. So that's crucial that you wire your batteries correctly. So here are my two batteries. Um, identical batteries, 130 amp hour batteries. So we've got two positive sides. And all that's happening in there is that that goes out and it joins into that one. And then all the electricity runs out from that one. And on this side, the negative side, we've got two negatives joined together and everything gets grounded via that side. So what's happened is, obviously electricity is a flow, so everything comes from this end through the battery out of that end. So it crosses over. If you imagine just crossing over like that, that's what's happened. It's going from there out of there, which means these are operating as one battery. What do we need to do now? Well, we need to connect the inverter up and go through and actually kind of like say, where am I gonna mount this? Where am I gonna mount that and fit my inverter? Um, there's nothing special about this bit. Um, it is just, that's the major bit that we've talked about now. Now I'm gonna fit the inverter and I'm gonna make a coffee. And oddly enough, I don't drink coffee. So you're about to see a coffee being made that's gonna be thrown away. So I'm sorry if that upsets you. Right, let's go and crawl in the back of the van. So like I say, the reason why I chose this particular inverter um, is not only because it's got this remote panel switch to be able to switch it on and off, um, but it's come with the correct um, accessories as well, which meaning the right cables to use. And very, very, very important, it's got an inline fuse. Yes, it's a big old beast, but I can hide it away in the new space I've got all the way down there. And then I can put this somewhere um, and we can just go Bosch, switch on, switch off, and that's it done. And it wasn't that expensive either. Um, considering we got all this kind of stuff, um, it was still under £200 for a 2 kilowatt inverter. So the way I'm going to wire this is they come with um, a washer, a locking washer, like a split washer, uh, which under compression keeps the nut from going loose, that's what those are, and a nut. So if you look at that end, it's quite a chunky end, and if you look there, there is a little bit of metal, but not a lot. And if you do that, there's going to be a bit of contact with it, but not a great deal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the washer there. 
and then creating the flat side of this. If you look at the profile, that's, that's flat, that's not. So I'm gonna do that. Put the split washer on top so that when I tighten the nut, that isn't gonna move around. And that's that. Now I wanna make sure that I leave the fan clear at the back because obviously that's going away. Um, and I'm gonna mount it using these feet here so I can't have it going down. And also that thing there is for the remote connector. So you can see now that when that crushes all that together, it's got a nice ground plane being the washer. You've then got the end of the cable. You've then got the split that is gonna crush down as you tighten that and that's all connected on and that's the way I'm gonna wire it. And I'm just gonna repeat that on this side for the uh, positive side as well. So there we go, that's on that side, that's on that side. I've got the remote wire there. Um, I'm still leaving it switched off. It has its own switch as well. Obviously you don't have to use the remote um, panel if you don't want to, but I just thought that was good. But once you've done all that, the caps go over the top like that. And then there's a little plastic nut and that protects all the uh, connection underneath it. So that's pretty good. So this is now wired in temporarily. Obviously these are the two big cables wired into that side and then that side for the red the black for our inverter. Let's press the remote control. The inverter comes on and it says that we've got 13 volts. Um, so that's pretty much ready to go. So what I need to do now is plug the coffee machine in, put some water on and see how we get on. So we're going to switch her on. There we go, we're on. Um, I'm going to put the coffee pot in there. That's how it works. Like I said, I don't make coffee. I'm going to do that and I'm going to press the button. Let's see if we get coffee. That's the inverter making that noise. And that's dropping down 11.8. Still one amp being drawn from the solar. And obviously as the hot water's no longer being boiled inside, that's cutting off. And then we're back up to 12.3. So as that's on, then 11.8 is what we dropped to. I asked Mandy to uh, sacrifice two of these coffee pods. I didn't just steal them, so I don't think these are her best ones or favourite ones. So I hope that helped. Cheers to anybody that likes to drink coffee. I'm going to have to pull that one away again. I am sorry. Right, so that's all fitted. Uh, obviously, you've seen it working, testing. Uh, you've seen the voltage drop, um, and then you've quickly seen the solar power um, regenerate to recover from the drop. So that's fine. And I've not got an amazing solar array. If you look up there now, you can see me fitting the panel. Um, like I say, I've also fitted the um, Victron Bluetooth solar controller. So you saw me monitoring that in real time, the voltage of the battery and the, um, you know, the way that the solar panel was quickly regenerating that. So if you want to learn a bit more about that, that's going to be up there now. So links down below in the video description to this particular inverter. And also at the same time, the link will be there to the full written explanation on my website of exactly what I've just spoken about, um, about how the different sine wave inverters work and how you calculate your um, needs against the batteries. And then more importantly, how you wire multiple batteries together. So that's all down in the video description. Right then, thanks for watching. And I'll catch you on the next video. Take care, bye.